The GFX 100S is a 102 megapixel medium format camera. That's pretty incredible. So let's talk about a few things I love about it. And since no camera's perfect, let's talk about a few things I hate. Stick around. What's going on everyone? Seth Miranda here coming to you from my studio. It's a little after hours, so that's the whole dark motif we got going on here. Forgive me for that. Uh, but I did a video recently on the Nikon Z9, some things I love about it, some things I'm not so psyched on about it. And it went over really well. And I mentioned that I also shoot the GFX 100S and I got a few comments and DMs asking me to do the same style video for this camera. So here we are. The Fujifilm GFX 100S is the second 100 megapixel medium format camera Fujifilm put out. The first one they put out was the GFX 100, which actually had like a grip on it. So you could have two batteries in there and stuff like that. It's, it's a great camera. It was $10,000. It still is available at $10,000 US. But then this one came out and it is the GFX 100S at only $6,000. And there's very few differences, but I think Fuji made a really good move with this. Now, I was lucky enough to be one of 20 some odd people to head to Tokyo for the original release of the first GFX 100 and use it in the field. I shot myself getting hand poked tattoo in Japan in low light. And then I got to do a portrait session with Strobe of the artist. It was awesome. I'll put a link to that video down below. Please check it out. It's one of my favorite videos I've done. And it's really awesome actually. Uh, but I was very fortunate to go do that when the launch of that camera came uh, to fruition. The GFX 100S kind of came out and they just like slid it under the radar. And then we were like, wait a minute, what? And they go, we know we're gonna make a bunch of people mad that they spent $4,000 more on the original GFX 100, but we don't care, this is awesome. And you know what? They're right, it is awesome. To shave that much money off and to make medium format that much more accessible is pretty special. You know, when you have other systems, Hasselblad, you know, phase one and all this, yeah, they have bigger sensors because medium format doesn't mean a specific size. They do have a bigger sensor, but they also come at a humongous price tag. We're talking 20, $40,000 systems here. Uh, and that's, you know, really kind of an investment or you're renting them, right? This is kind of the camera that is the price of a flagship in full frame. So think about it like this, the, uh, the Sony Alpha One, $6,500. The Nikon Z9, $5,500. The Canon R3, which they're not calling by their flagship, but at the time of recording this, it kind of is their flagship, uh, is $6,000 right in the middle. And so is this, but it's a different philosophy. And that's what I kind of think the theme of this talk is going to be is that when you pick up this camera, you're kind of going into it with a different philosophy than you would a speed demon camera like the Z9 that's doing a billion frames per second and you know high res and all that kind of stuff or, or the Alpha One that's high res and does a billion frames per second and all that stuff. You know, this is the camera that will give you a really special image quality. Now, I have been attacked when I've mentioned this camera, people going, oh, 100 megapixels, that's stupid, you don't need that. Well, my first argument to that is, no, you don't need it, but it's awesome and here's why. There's plenty of times I pull out this camera and with a client that say, you know, we do like a head to toe look. I shoot the frames, I give them the frames and they can literally crop in to just the face, just the watch, just the earring, a detail on the jacket, the shoes, and it's all usable. And when clients feel that, they come back. And when you can do more with an image in an era where we have multiple formats to publish in, you know what I'm talking about. You know, Instagram has its size. The things that happen for, you know, banner pages on someone's social media is another size. Their website needs some sort of different look. One image could be the image itself, but then also zoomed in, faded out, becomes, you know, a menu for their website. Like all this stuff, the, the images have to be more and more versatile. It is not easy out there. This industry is tough. And the more you can offer a client, the more they're gonna feel value within you and they're gonna hire you again, you know? I'm not saying that this is just like a pro use camera. If you have the resources and you're a hobbyist and you just love having this much image quality and depth to your images or files, I should say, go for it. But as far as not needing the 102 megapixel, you don't always need high res. Like I shoot with a Z6 II as well as the Z9 and there's plenty of cameras that were $6,000, $6,500. There were 16 to 22 megapixels out there. You can totally get through that. But the fact that you have the ability to get 102 megapixels in the palm of your hand in the size and feel of what would be considered a DSLR kind of is amazing. Hands down is amazing. So what I would urge you to think about is not, oh, I don't need it, but more rather the 
fact that you have the capability and it's in your hand already. One of the things that goes on with higher res cameras, and I think a lot of people found this out when the D800 came out or the D850 is without stabilization, the higher res your camera goes, the more likely you can show camera shake because there's just that much more information being captured between the pixels, right? You know, just a little tiny micro shift will actually show up when there's pixels in between that where that shift shows up on the plane. I'm not gonna go down this road. Regardless, higher the res, the more likely you are to show camera shake. It's one of those things. It's kind of interesting, right? You get more detail, but more likely for it to not to be sharp. You alleviate that with things like stability, and that's what the GFX100 has. When the first one got announced and we heard it was gonna be stabilized, all of our jaws hit the floor and my brain fell out of the back of my head. I couldn't wait to try this camera out, and it was awesome. And then you come in and tell me I can save almost half the price and a smaller footprint and I can get going with this and have the same feel, I'm in, I'm in. So this camera is more about intent. You're going into it going, I want resolution, I want the color depth, I want the range, I want to see it all. I wanna have these files that are big and meaty and I can just like really work with them or whatever. If you are that type of photographer that edits a lot, I'm not a photographer that edits a lot, but I do like having really rich files. I mean, I think anybody can attest to wanting more detail, wanting more range, right? And that's what's really funny about this as well is, while Fujifilm is kind of famous for their color and it's gorgeous and all the film simulation profiles you get in this that can actually get married to your raw file if you wanted to, which you can't say about other brands. Usually the raw file is one thing and then the color profile goes to the JPEG and you, you don't really get on the raw file. But here, the, the simulation, the film simulation or color profile can go along with the raw file and still maintain a raw file. I digressed on that one, but hear me out on this. So as far as the tones go, as much as they're known for color, and sorry if you hear the shaking of these tabs, I always think I'm gonna take them off. I never use straps anyway. The funny thing about this camera is I constantly keep leaning on it for black and white because this camera shows me every tone I want out of my grayscale. And you can ask anybody that's worked with me, I am a psychopath about tone range in my black and white. I am not a fan of this Calvin Klein flat gray profile stuff that some people probably sold you as a preset. I am not a fan of it. I think. Fuji Film's acro setting with the yellow filter applied gets me kind of in the ballpark of what I'm looking for, but I can tether this, which what I normally always do is tether this camera because it's one of those cameras that I use mainly for studio work, and I'm gonna talk more on that later. Uh, the fact of the matter is that I'm looking at the color grade as I'm shooting, and I'm shooting to the color grade. In this case, I shoot a lot of grayscale with it. That being said, Every time I shoot grayscale, I'm psyched on it. And then I look at the files in color and I go through this Sophie's Choice psychotic breakdown of, oh, the color looks so good. Do I want to use the color? Oh my God, I don't know. And it's just a, it's a great problem to have, right? The images are just so versatile and you can just have so many options and choices and things you're happy with. So the biggest strength of this camera to me is 100% the image quality, without a doubt. But with everything that you get one way, there's always a trade-off, right? Either power consumption or the camera's slower. Well, in this situation, the camera may be slower than something like, say, an Alpha 1 or something like a Z9, but you kind of don't care because you're going into it with an intent to shoot that image. You want that image. I'm not going to a football game with this thing and shooting a billion frames per second hoping I caught a moment. I'm shooting intentful pieces in a studio mainly, or in controlled environments out there, or out in the field, it's not really a, a walk around banger, guys. And some people do treat it as that, and that's because it kind of is easy to carry around. It might be heavier for some of you like kids that grew up in mirrorless land, but for DSLR shooters, this feels like home. The grip is incredible. I don't ever feel like I can drop this thing. Ah, to give you a heart attack. It's built amazing. I have thrown this thing in the back of cars. I, I, I've chucked it around. I mean, I am not easy on my gear. And you can ask anyone that shares a studio with me. I buy pro gear and I abuse my pro gear. It's just what I am. Okay, guys, hate me down in the comments. It'll help my algorithm. Uh, but the reality is the, the speed of this camera is like having a D850, you know, five frames a second, which is kind of like DSLR land, right? Like the D850 was five. I, I feel like I'm back in a DSLR as far as 
the speed that I shoot at with this camera. And not to mention, you also get a little bottleneck when you're shooting tethered. If I have a pretty good MacBook, I mean, it's the 16 inch when I first came out and I maxed out the specs and it still takes a few seconds for this to fully render a file to a point that when I'm tethering, I think I'm out of focus, but, but it's just taking that much longer for the images to render. When I punch in while I'm tethering and I check if the eye's sharp or something like that, uh, you think it's soft, but it actually will go one, two, three, boom, and then there it is, sharp as you could want. So it's kind of interesting that uh, it, the files are that big, that it takes that much processing. Maybe it's different with, uh, you know, computers going forward, like maybe if I got the new M1 MacBooks or whatever's coming forward. Either way, the computers will always get more and more powerful, so that's not really a drawback for me, but it is something that I do find my workflow gets a little weirded out by like, oh man, I'm not seeing it right away. I'm not punching in right away and seeing it and just going, going, going. I'm a big fan of being fast on set speed in general. Uh, but this camera, because I pick it up going into the mindset that I'm kind of taking a minute, I'm, I'm really focusing into what I want to do for a second. I don't really get uh, crazy about that. One of the things that I really like about this camera is the top screen. Like I said in the Z9 video, I love the top screens. What's weird about this one is that when you turn it off, the screen stays on and I constantly think that the camera itself is on. And I just wish that Fujifilm gave us the option to just say, hey, I want the screen completely off. I don't know how much battery that drains. I don't, I doubt if, if much, but you know, if you leave it on a shelf for a while or you're traveling and it's like a 14 hour plane ride or something like that, uh, I'm wondering how much battery you do sacrifice on that, which is totally minor, totally like, nah, whatever. But it is something I wish there was an option on here. Uh, one of the things I do love about this camera as well is kind of how the controls go. So the front dial is actually a button itself and I have it, uh, set so that when I press it in, I can choose between f-stop or ISO. So if I want to adjust either one with this dial, I can just tap it and it'll switch over to that control, which is super useful. Uh, in a studio setting, you might not need to change your ISO so much, like if ever at all, because you're controlling everything. But when you're out there on the fly and you just want to not take your face away from the EVF and you have to look for a button, hold it, spin this, or, or spin another thing here. Like the fact that you can just tap this and then control it and then tap it again to go to another control. It's just nice to know in your head, you have two controls built into the right where your finger is, which is, you know, a fraction of an inch away from the uh, shutter itself. And, and, and stuff, little things like that go a long way with, for guys like me. Uh, let me know down below if that's something you're into. If you're familiar with Fujifilm, you know the interface is the same as pretty much every other interface. So uh, you are flying through it in that regard. The other great thing is you can customize the size of your focus point. It's awesome. I mean, you can literally press it in and then just dial in how big or small you want that box to be, which is what I wanted in the 3D uh, focus tracking, whatever they call it in the Z9 but I kind of get it here. So it's just very customizable. So if you're going like single point or like small and then large, like you can just dial it in. Super cool, super useful. Uh, the lenses, the lenses are great. They are cost effective for what medium format is. If you look at Hasselblad lenses or anything like that, they're up there in price. And a lot of the reasons is usually like the, the leaf shutter and some other things. I'm not gonna get into that, but this camera has a pretty well fleshed out medium format lens lineup and they're relatively quiet for what they are. If you've ever used a hospital or something like that, it sounds like a power drill, like rah, rah, rah. It's like, whoa, calm down. Uh, I don't get that here. They are gonna be a larger size lens in general for the physics that is a medium format sensor. And I'm sure someone down in the comments is gonna write, it's not really medium format. 645 is medium format. Okay, calm down. It's bigger than full frame, so it's medium format. Shh, shh, I know, shh. It'll be okay, it'll be okay, shh, shh. It'll be okay, it'll be okay. With the bigger sensor though, it's able to handle that resolution. I'm finding in full frame cameras that are around 60 megapixels, I'm finding noise values I'm not happy with. In this camera, I don't see that. When you start creeping up the ISO in situations, I don't deal with noise problems as much as I do on full frames that are packed. So it gives it a little bit more breathing room for that resolution. So it just feels like it's engineered for what it's trying to be, which is a medium format system with good resolution and stability. So I, I can't rave on about the image quality enough. I really can't. 
If you get a chance to either rent one or try one out, bring a memory card to a store, shoot some frames, take the files home and take a look at it, or you know, go to a Fujifilm event, they have them all the time. Uh, I don't know where we are right now in the world, but they definitely do. They showed up to my Halloween special effects workshop. They were there, they had a table and you could have tried out a GFX shooting zombies with me. So, you know, it, it, it's a thing, it does happen. I urge you to just check out the image quality, get out of this. It's, it's awesome, it really, really is. And even if you're someone that's not really sure what you're looking at for image quality, you can look at these files and go, wow. Uh, if you want to take a look virtually, I know my buddy Ab Cisse does a live stream on Adorama's Twitch channel once a week where he shoots with the GFX and he really punches in and shows you the latitude of all these files and you can go check that out. I'll put a link to the Twitch channel down below. You can follow and check out Ab as well. His work is amazing and a lot of that is shot with the GFX so you can get a sense of what you know the output is, okay? Uh, but back to the lenses. So. The lenses are G-mount and there is only one camera system that's G-mount, right? So it's this is where I start getting into areas of the camera that I'm having issues with, but not because they're bad, but just because it's the way things are. So this is a G-mount lens. If I bought a lens for say my Nikon Z9, I could use that Z-mount on this Z6 you're watching on me right now, my Z62 backup camera and some other cameras out there. Uh, I think I have a Z, oh yeah, I have a Z50 in there uh, as another backup if I need it for a streaming camera. So either way, I feel okay investing into the Z-mount lenses. With the, this lens, it's kind of hard because I'm buying it just for this system and only when I use this camera. And when I use other cameras, it's kind of like, an investment that's not coming back to me, right? Right. Like So this isn't the, the camera I'm gonna pull out for high volume work. Uh, with the file sizes so big, with the workflow slowing back down, it's not there for me as far as high volume work, but it is there for me for really high quality, high end commercial work. I'm telling you, when they see the files, they're just astonished and they just, the conference room gets boosted up and your image is just bananas, I love it. Now, because this isn't for high volume and I'm not using it so much, if I bought a $3,000 lens, it's kind of hard for me to get that money back. So right now, this is a 110 F2, which is one of the most beautiful lenses I think I've ever shot with. It is stunningly beautiful. And I have a 45 millimeter for it and that's it, right? And that really puts me into a weird place of having like a wide-ish angle 45 millimeter or this 110 which kind of feels like an 85 millimeter lens. So as far as versatility goes, or if you guys know me, I love my 24 to 120 on my Nikon because I like having all that range to work with. I don't have that here. So I am currently working on getting a 45 to 100 millimeter lens for this camera. We are in a tough spot in the world as of right now recording this video. Stock is just tough, but it is going to be a $2,500-ish investment for me, and I have to see that money come back. Now, while this is low cost for medium format in general, $2,500 is a camera to some people, right? Or it's a, it is, I mean, you're looking at me in a camera that costs less than that. So it's tough, right? It's tough for me to get uh, to, to flesh out the system as a whole. And the way I look at it is I wouldn't really buy another G-mount camera, right? There's nothing or no reason really to buy something else. What do I, to get what, the 50 megapixel one? Nah, I'm good. The, a rangefinder version? Nah, I'm not really looking for the rangefinder version. And if they come out with a better version of this somehow that it's faster or whatever, I would just upgrade to it. So then I would just be replacing this camera. So. I struggle with, should I invest more into this system? I already did buy separate triggers for my Profoto lights with the, the foot to work with this shoe. Uh, and again, uh, Profoto stayed up to date with all their firmware to make sure that all these cameras work seamless. Uh, so I, I think I'm going in for like one more lens and that's pretty much it. I bought some extra batteries and that's that. Uh, as far as and, and I guess if that's where I'm gonna go with this as far as negatives, let's start going into the negatives for this thing. Okay, and there aren't many. And again, the negatives are only situational because it's not really a bad point because I really don't hate on this camera. So one of the first things that kind of makes me go, Ugh, is that the dual card slots are SD memory. Now this again isn't bad because the memory is easier to get, it's lower cost than CF Express Type-B, uh, but, 
I'm moving into Save Express Type B with all my Nikon stuff and some other things that I use. So it kind of is the only thing that's sticking out in my system as needing SD, aside from like maybe smaller gadgets here and there. But I do have a lot of SD memory from all the years of using SD. So it's not the worst thing in the world, uh, but I do wish I could just move into Save Express Type B. That is like whatever. In fact, it's kind of interesting that with files this large, you don't really need to get Save Express Type B memory for a camera like this. But I will say you definitely want to get the best performing SD cards you can get if you're shooting to card. Um, I shoot mainly tethered. I think a lot of people with this camera will mainly shoot tethered, but I could be wrong. Everyone else, everyone's different, right? Uh, the other thing that I will say about this camera uh, that I will say is maybe an actual disappointment, but again, it's not that bad. Uh, is the focusing in lower light situations, it can start getting confused. And what I mean by that is once the light level gets to a point where the camera's like, wait, what? I can't see where I'm going. You want that thing? It doesn't know. It just happens. And maybe that's where you save some money on the medium format system. But in a studio setting, it's never an issue. Uh, I have lights, my, my modeling lights are on my subject or whatever, but let's say I was out in the field and I'm using speed lights. Well, if that ambient light drops a little too low, sometimes this camera has a tough time negotiating in darker situations, but I'm, I mean, this is nitpicky as far as the focus goes, because for what this camera is giving you, the focus is fast. The focus has been accurate for me. And quite frankly, it's doing detection as well. You know, uh, the face and eye detection, all that stuff with all the other data, this thing is sucking out of the sensor and everything. It's doing a pretty good job. Uh, other than that, the only other thing I could say is, uh, kick the tripod. All right, well, the, one of the other negative things maybe I would talk about is that the rolling shutter could be better on this thing, right? It's a larger sensor, larger plane of travel for the shutter to go. So it is a little slower than maybe you're used to if you're doing the electronic shutter or video work. So keep that in mind as well. It, it, it's not an issue for me. If I had to say something, maybe that as well. All right, let me fix this tripod. Thing I could say is I wish there was some form of compression system for the raw files similar to the Z9. When you use HE star on the Z9, you get uh, a, like a half the file size. If there was something similar to that in this without losing the image quality, I think it would be a huge bonus. I think uh, the compression algorithms we're gonna see in the future are gonna be really where things are going because we want the resolution and all the data, but we don't wanna deal with the storage and having to transfer in the speeds and all that stuff. So I just kinda of wish there was some sort of like new compression going on in here, but I'm not really crying over that either. Uh, this camera has just been awesome. Uh, this, I will say that I never really pick up this camera for things like video. It is capable of 4K 30 frames per second, but this isn't what I'm going to. So if I did need something and this is all I had, I could get through doing video. The one thing that really bothers me is the HDMI port is a micro, which is the least favorite of all the HDMI ports but I'm sure that wasn't a priority for the design of this camera. Uh, it does, you know, make you wonder though, the camera is relatively large in size, why they couldn't even give you like an HDMI mini at the, at the least would have been interesting uh, to have just, you know, all my uh, Z62s are HDMI mini, would have, it would have matched, you know? Uh, but again, not really going to this for, uh, for video. Uh, the battery consumption is, relatively good considering what this system is. It is a high powered, high information, high data system. But yeah, there, there's room for improvement on the battery maybe. Uh, but again, you're usually shooting in controlled environments with this. So going to a charger and just trading batteries, not a big thing. And one of the good things is that the charger that I got for this is dual well. So which means it can actually take two batteries at once. And what's even cooler about it is that you can actually see a percentage value on the charger of how much battery you have left on whichever one you're charging or pulling out of theirs. That's pretty awesome. I gotta say, you know, I know a lot of people out there that use battery chargers that have like a blinking light and you just wait for it to turn green. You're like guessing how much you got on that battery when you pull it out and before it's finished and just to get the job finished. Uh, so that was a nice touch, Fuji. Thank you so much for that. Um, other than that, I will say I have very few qualms about this camera and I am going to just say, I'm sorry if these videos seem clickbaity by saying hate, 
But the reality is these aren't cameras I'm being given to review. These aren't cameras that I am just trying out. These are cameras that I was confident in for after trying them out and then moved into those systems, okay? So if I'm already using it, if it's a camera that I'm going to rely on, if it's something that I made a decision to include in my kit as a working professional, it needs to shoot to pay two rents in the city, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna hate much on it, but there is no such thing as a perfect camera, right? There's only the right camera for you. And if you're someone that's looking for a speed demon that's got fast file transfers, also, not the camera. But if you're someone that wants to do really intense portrait work, incredible commercial work, editorials, you know, jewelry shoots, you know, things that need epic detail. I mean, this camera for what you're getting price-wise is, I, I can't, what, I could not believe that this thing was $6,000. Like when I heard this was coming down the pipeline, I, I thought it was a mistake. I was like, there's no way that they're doing this for six. They just put out one for 10 grand. Why is this one only six grand? Regardless of that, uh, it is an accessible, higher end feeling image. You know, the medium format was this thing that most people were never going to touch. And here you are with the same price as full frame cameras. And it's probably only to, going to get less expensive and more accessible from here. Smaller, lower price, more uh, processing power for faster frames, faster focusing, all that stuff. Things that I was talking about in this video as a negative would probably just go away, right? So it's really hard for me to genuinely say something I hate about this camera. I can only say something about it that might not fit your use case. I think that's fair. So again, I apologize if you think these are clickbaity. Uh, I don't throw things at the lens gear wise unless I genuinely believe in them. And again, not sponsored. This video is not sponsored by Fujifilm. Uh, they had no money exchanged hands here. This is my camera, okay? So I'm just sharing you some insights with, I'm just sharing you, I'm sharing with you some insights off the top of my head about gear that's actually in my kit. I mean, listen, you know how these work by now. They're off the cuff, one take off the top of my head, and I'm talking about what most stands out to me experience-wise about the gear that's actually in my hand when I actually do my job and have to really rely on things, right? So I hope this was kind of helpful to you guys. Uh, if there's something I didn't touch on, let me know in the comments. But for the most part, the GFX 100S, I, I love this camera. I love this camera. It's just not for every single use case that I personally have. Uh, but there's never been a time I picked up this camera, shot with it and go, oh man, if I, why didn't I just use, could have had, why didn't I? The only thing that's holding me back right now is me not having the lens selection. Other than that, oof, like oof, so good. So good. For me, uh, I, this, is, this is such a cool thing to get to use. Uh, it's one of these cameras that when I pick it up, I'm excited. It's one of these cameras that, what I'm gonna say to you is probably gonna get a lot of hate in the comments, but what I'm gonna say is when I see a camera, and it's my camera, and it's on a, a table or I had to carry it somewhere, I don't look at it like, oh yeah, this is awesome. I look at it like, well, that's my hammer and I gotta go build this fence. You know, it's, it's a tool and it's a job for me, right? So I just think of it as work. When I pick up this camera, when I see this camera, I just get so amped at what I'm able to pull out as an image quality from real life that I just wanna go shoot. I don't know if I can relay this idea to anybody out there, but there's something special about when the gear makes you want to shoot. And maybe that's just being spoiled or, you know, just being a gear hound maybe. But as far as a creative goes, it's very um, uplifting and energizing to have equipment that makes you want to go do it. So that's what I get with this. Anyway, um, I hope this was useful. If you did like it, please give me a like. It helps this channel out. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and the bell to get notified when I put out more videos like this.